Well, I've got Shane in a talkative mood. We're going to go talk to her um, arms. <laughs> Shall we talk this little carbon baby? Yeah, so there's lots of questions regarding why have I used fiberglass in items such as this and the rudder blade. But we'll start with this because we're in the hot little engine room where this is. It's not all glass, obviously you can see there's a lot of carbon there. Um, not everything has to be carbon. <laughs> there's, there's stuff that's fit for purpose. So this is a uh, what we call a monolithic built component, which means that there's technically no core other than the actual uh, composite material itself. So I actually break the monolithic part down into a cord structure by having carbon on each side of fiberglass, and the fiberglass actually makes up the core. So. I don't actually need the carbon around this neutral axis area uh, for its stiffness and strength. I can actually use glass in this, this middle area. And of course, uh, it's cheaper and easier to get fiberglass when you're in the middle of the Caribbean than it is uh, carbon. And I was very limited with the amount of carbon that I had, so I had to uh, think wisely how I used it. The original idea was actually to completely isolate the steering system from the rudder. You don't end up with an electrolysis problem with the carbon shaft, but you do have an electrical current running through it. So the less electrical current uh, potentials through, you know, the hydraulic hoses and the hydraulic oil inside through the metal um, ram itself, through the bolt here and into the super conductive <laughs> carbon fiber tiller extension and carbon fiber tiller stock by having a full isolated fiberglass tiller arm was my original thought. Uh, I actually break the connection uh, or the electrical leak potential uh, from the steering system to the actual rudder and the water. Um, but of course, everything got rushed in the end and I ended up with carbon, full carbon wrap on the outside and didn't end up with the isolation. But that's sort of hopefully answers some of the questions to the tiller arm. Did, didn't you need it to do the carbon because it was stronger as well? On the outside, yeah, it's stiffer. Um, so you'll see the clamp arrangement here. You can see I've just found some bolts out of the box and they're way too long. And of course, this clamp, this tiller arm literally went on six hours before we left to cross the Atlantic. So I haven't come back to actually cut these bolts uh, to the correct length. But stiffness was quite critical around this flange compo uh, component here. Uh, the geometry of this inherently makes this part of the arm quite stiff, but having two flanges coming out at the back end here is not naturally very stiff. Um, if I was to do it again, um, I would potentially put a return flange on the top here to help stiffen this corner up. Um, but of course didn't have the time to do that so i had to make this quite stiff and the obvious solution is lots of carbon so that was the reason why i pushed down the route of putting more and more carbon in this just because i was running out of time and time wasn't on my side to do more and more laminate and just pure glass so all right so just the the geometry of something that you'd have to do in the normal glass was a bit more complicated than you could just yep. beef it up with the carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it simple. Yeah, because obviously with the stiffness of carbon, uh, it's quite good, which means I can drop out. Well, it becomes a simpler problem because you're ending up with a stiffer, stronger material. So mm -hmm. your solution becomes smaller and lighter and easier. Um, yeah. Certainly could have been done in glass, no dramas at all. 
but it would have taken a little bit more cleverness and I just didn't have the time, obviously, to, to do that. Make it. And then so how do we how are we dealing with the electrolysis issue? Um, we're not. We just pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's anodes on the sail drive, which desperately need uh, changing at the moment. But um, the electrical potential leak is quite small uh, in that where you would have seen we actually have a full fiberglass skinned blade. So the uh, that's fully isolated. The only contact area with the water is the stainless steel bearing shell in the water and whatever carbon stock is down the bottom. We can isolate this, no dramas at all. Inside here is actually a full solid fiberglass piece. So it's actually solid fiberglass from the top to the bottom through here. Um, and it's a lug that's about this long. The only bit that's carbon is this little tiny two millimeter skin around it. So to isolate it is quite easy. I can do a fine grind away of the carbon around the hole, both sides, and then put that um, fiberglass plate top and bottom uh, with a small backfill where I ground the uh, uh, carbon away and it's fully isolated. Mm. You don't need much isolation to completely isolate it fiberglass is an awesome isolator and that's why it's called e-glass so everything these e-glass boats it's called e-glass because it's electrical glass it's intended for electrical isolation in the electrical uh, industry and that's why that material is priced so well because uh, large industry uses so much of that material well first of all I didn't have enough carbon to make the blade carbon. Uh, so that was the first answer. Um, second one is uh, fit for purpose. I didn't have the black stuff to do it. I had little time to get the black stuff. Um, and we had the, we had the glass, glass there, sitting there. Yeah. And it does the job. Um, yes, the preference would have been to do it in carbon. Um, but the e-glass is more than sufficient enough and we know that because it's just brought us back across the Atlantic with no dramas at all. Yeah, that's um, fantastic. Yeah, and then we put the carbon where it needed to be, so the carbon rudder stock. Yeah. And that carbon rudder stock was same price as what we were getting for the A stainless one. steel one. Yeah. So for us in our you know area of expertise, much better to go with the carbon. Um, and we could tailor it a bit to our needs as well. Yep. And uh, and the torque tabs are definitely out of carbon too. So there, there's a lot of load that needs to go from the rudder stock, no, from the blade to the rudder stock, or from the rudder stock to the blade. How does it work? Both ways. Both, both ways. Like Hannah said, our preference is to try and use a plastic part and a, a black plastic part, just because of our background. When we looked at it. We investigated both uh, aluminium, stainless steel, and carbon fiber, and fiberglass rudder stocks, right? All the options, because we're in a place where we didn't have many options, so we had to look at all the options. E-glass got dropped out of the equation very quickly because we were restricted by dimensions of the bearings already inside the boat. And I just couldn't get enough fiberglass in there to make it work. Uh, Yachts like uh, Lagoon actually have fiberglass rudder stocks in them and they are perfectly good, fit for purpose, great rudder stocks. And it actually addresses that electrolysis problem I was talking to you about earlier with uh, in the engine room. So on the list now was aluminium, stainless steel and um, carbon fiber. The aluminium and the stainless steel options, aluminium got dropped out pretty quickly because uh, other boats we've seen, the issue with the aluminium is actually wear from the bearings. It wears the aluminium quite quickly. Electrolysis wise, you know, the grades that are being used are quite good in that they don't fizz out. You know, there's, there's aluminium and there's aluminium. Um, there are grades that are much more tolerant to uh, electrolysis and oxidization than others. Um, so it was a very valid option, but it got canned for us um, 
just because of the wear factor and the style of bearing that I had to use. That left two options, the stainless steel option and the carbon fiber option. The stainless steel option, well, there was three options inside of the stainless steel option. There was standard 316, then there's going to 2205 grades and several other uh, pH 17.4 grade uh, rudder stocks and that could alter my diameters and weights and bending stiffnesses etc etc etc. The issue with that option was cost and availability. Um, it was quite costly. Yeah, I, was, I was surprised how expensive yeah. it was. The biggest one for me though was the integration of the stainless steel blade uh, the stainless steel stock into the blade versus the carbon fiber stock into the blade and this is why the torque tabs of a stainless steel blade is completely different to the composite carbon fiber one the stainless steel blade you cannot bond to the stainless steel very well at all resin to stainless steel bonds and their shear capacities are terrible even when we use some of the coolest glues there are available, it's still a crap bond. Um, and this is why stainless steel and metal uh, stocks and skeletons have these massive tabs to bond to the fiberglass skins. Oh, so it's a bonding <coughs> issue, not, it's a, bonding not issue. a, uh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was a... Uh... Yeah. So, and the other thing that you'll find is generally rudders that are built with metal components inside them, they're trying to build inside female moulds with predefined skins and the stainless steel conformity is not very good. So to get the actual fiberglass uh, bond, like even a mechanical sort of fiberglass over a stainless steel part, it's extremely difficult. So you generally find yourself with the big metal tabs sitting inside some type of glue um, whether it's rubber toughened or talc filled or uh, cabasol filled or aerosol filled and that's that's what we did with those rudders that we got kent to make in valencia too didn't we they were yes they were bogged in and again the stainless steel stocks and tabs that we had in valencia they were quite long, big metal things that stuck out because of the ex exact issues that I was talking about. And the, our rudders were built really well in that we had high quality PVC foams and not crap urethane filled foams like most of the production built rudders for production built boats is, are really terrible. They use some terrible materials. Um, you know, coming from race boat world, having guys that build race boat rudders is you know they build them the right way so the amount of glue bond areas versus you know actual structural foam cores is very small yeah all rudders are not created yeah. equal the amount you know it the time it took Kent to um, make those rudders for us in Valencia a production facility would have made 20 yeah <laughs> so there's a massive difference in the, in the current construction methods so looking at the price difference going to carbon was okay I could get either or same price but with the carbon one I can now actually integrate the blade into the stock much better in that I can bond to the stock so my glue bond areas are gonna stick um, because it's all the same structure so my tabs didn't even really need to be tabs. All I had to do is provide a shear connection between the round carbon tube rotating and the skin in the blade. In addition to that, I can actually bond the foam core to the rudder stock itself. So it actually becomes a torque turning component of the whole puzzle as well. So. I can look at my shear connections for my carbon tube to my skins and say actually my safety factor is going to be my glue bond to my foam. Um, so my torque tabs don't 
have to be huge. And it's probably incorrect calling of a torque tab in that it should be more called a shear connection because it is definitely a torque tab in a metal structure because it's a tab that hangs out the back that delivers torque to the blade. Whereas in the carbon one, it's more a shear connection. And anything else we need to add? Did an amazing job. Yes. Because across the um, Atlantic from St. Martin back to Spain. Yep. Really, really happy. Yep. And there was a noticeable difference between tacks to answer everyone's questions <laughs> that are in their minds. Yeah, now. well, because we only did one. No, we did two tacks. We did. We were on two different ports. No, but we only did one rudder. Oh, yes, we only did one rudder. So we had a Valencian built rudder, uh, which was the splashed off the America's Cup uh, version 5 boats from Valencia. And we had the new one that I built in the Caribbean. Yeah, so we had asymmetric rudders. Asymmetric rudders. And definitely um, the performance difference was marked. <laughs> it was yeah. a big step forward again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very uh, happy, very happy with it. Yes. So I suppose in finishing, we should really explain a little bit about what we're doing back here in Spain because it wasn't our plan. Yeah, so there was a massive rush to leave the Caribbean. Yeah, and so we had to do rudders, chain plates, windows. glue in windows. Uh, there was a, oh, a huge list. Yeah, we, we'd planned to go to Trinidad to um, do a refit of the boat. Yeah, because we're really, we're really happy with Paquia and we've been taking uh, weight out in bits and bits. Yeah. and uh, just keeps performing better and better and the new chain plates and the rudders and, and all this upgrades that we've been doing it's a fantastic little boat so now we've decided that yeah we're going to redo the interior because we think it's worthwhile so the plan was to go and do all of that in Trinidad this summer uh, however you got a phone call yeah got a phone call and um, I've been asked to come back and I'm well and truly neck deep into it now. Um, I am running a, the rig and systems program for an America's Cup team. Um, yeah. But yeah, just in case you're wondering what we've been up to. Yeah. I've been busy putting America's Cup AC40s together. So that's our primary training and learning boat. And um, very shortly we'll start uh, full noise into the big 75 um, yeah so it's very exciting very just, we exciting. just have to work out what we're allowed to say on YouTube and what <laughs> yeah. we're not allowed to say yes. there's quite a few rules there is a lot of rules about what we can and can't say about the boats and what we can take pictures of because I'm part of the team and the whole protocol thing um, I'm not even allowed to have certain uh, weather apps on my telephone because they uh, breach. They contravene the protocol. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're outside the protocol. So we've got to be actually very careful about what we have and what we say and what we do just because I am in part of the whole circus. Yeah, but I think there's, you know, we're going to talk to them. We don't want to upset anyone, but we'll try and share what we learn and at yeah. least in terms of. Um, you know what we're really interested in in terms of our cruising is is I, I think the foil sort of technology and stuff is really cool yeah. I'd like to know what developments are going on there there's like a heap of stuff that I think you know being involved in these sort of circles gives you so much more knowledge that you can apply to your own sailing and cruising and there's no reason why you can't look at what they're doing in, in those sort of racing circles and go ah that's how I can get some performance out of my own boat so yeah yeah I think it'll be yeah and there's definitely an area that's been of interest for me even before being part of the cup was this D section double skinned mainsails um, Obviously, I'm very heavily involved in it now. And the potential application for that in a non-Grand Prix style boat, using that offshore and as a cruising boat, is definitely um, very intriguing for me and it will be in the back of my mind every step of the way uh, through the whole program. Um, learning what the pitfalls are, where the problems are, 
and how they could be overcome to get this trickle-down effect that the America's Cup is supposed to be and trying to be um, in bringing these developments and technologies that are at F1 America's Cup level down into the general populace of sailing. Yeah, I, I love it how I'm thinking about foils and you're thinking about sails. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Foils on cruising boats? No. Ah, uh, but just foil <laughs> sections and stuff. Yeah, yeah, def definitely. But yeah, and then yes, absolutely, sails are very, very exciting because we have just got a new headsail that we are testing out too. So um, we want to talk a little bit more about cruising sails because there is a lot of questions that we get asked about that and what we use and mm -hmm. what we think is good and. Um, I think it's an area that has just so much potential. There's really, yeah. I don't know. I, I, we haven't found the perfect thing yet, have we? There is no perfect thing, um, but certainly, as far as you know, the bare basics for performance cruising boats. Um, one is the performance factor. Two is reliability, and I can't stress enough reliability. You know. You see what I, Anna and I and the kids do. We go, we go places. We use the boat, and reliability for lot, us yeah. is paramount. Um, and cost, you know, <laughs> we are not millionaires by any stretch of the <laughs> imagination. Yeah. So budget is a huge thing for us, as like most of you guys. So finding these solutions. Um, that ticks most, at least most of the boxes. Yeah, right? it is at the forefront uh, of, of our minds all the time. Uh, yes, I do get to play with uh, <laughs> lots of millions of dollars worth of boats in, in other parts of life, but to be able to adapt those technologies so that we can use it and you can use it is, is definitely always something that's on our mind. Yeah, why not, right? Yeah. Okay, well I think we might leave it there. Yep. And we'll see you next time.